Film people can be absolute maniacs. For example, there's that one guy on Twitter who actually goes out of his way to give his lousy take on Big Mama's House 2 on every single tweet he can find. Whoa, I wanna make it. Then there are the numerous tales of directors that treat their actors horribly because of their extreme passion for filmmaking. This is where it all begins. That desire to create something great. This would be the catalyst that would bring us countless classics throughout all forms of entertainment. Back in Japan during the 1950s, love for the craft would bring about one of the biggest genres the country has ever seen. Starting off with this hidden old little gem called and then splitting off into a whole plethora of ideas. You've got cannibalistic mushroom people, giant crap monsters, and a ninja turtle that shoots jet streams from its leg sockets. But we'll be getting to him another day. This popular craze even found its way to the United States, where we would get classics such as Attack of the 50-Foot Woman and Beginning of the End. You could probably dig around at the bottom of your couch and find some stupid Godzilla ripoff just waiting to bore you for the next hour and a half. Though, through the countless monster movies, you'll find a few hidden gems, even fewer genuinely great films, and a surplus of... You're my creation! I made you! Although... The one kaiju movie we're discussing today is truly one of a kind. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard a few rumors of this little country called North Korea. <laughs> Rumor has it, it's not the most cool of places, and all the rumors you've heard are probably right. It really doesn't strike me as the nicest of places to live. All the oppression, death camps, egotistical maniacs running around the country, it doesn't really vibe with me. But that's aside from the point. Well, kinda. Today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into one of the worst kaiju movies to ever be put on the silver screen, and the incredible tale behind it. A story of twisted family lineage, the reunion of star-crossed lovers, and men in big rubber suits. <laughs> Hello, my name is Cynical Justin, and today we'll be talking about the story of Pulgasari, the North Korean kaiju movie. So, as I'm sure any viewer of mine knows, is likely the most critical and influential kaiju movie to have ever been released. Its immense success and popularity spawned a wave of various films of the same genre that would dominate the Japanese box office until the mid-1970s. And as we'll soon come to see, movies like Daddy! would have a significant impact on moviegoers and filmmakers alike. There are many different people notable to this narrative, but let's first begin with the story of director Shin Sang Ok. Shin was a passionate, up-and-coming filmmaker in a post-Korean War South Korea. Despite the lowly state of the country, Shin made every effort to pursue his dream and passion for filmmaking. In the 1950s, he would finally start doing just that and become an extremely prolific director. His ambition would lead him to beat the most famous of directors in the box office, even with all the odds stacked against his favor. Shin was considered an anomaly in the South Korean filmmaking world. He was a true innovator of his craft and wasn't afraid to tackle taboo subjects or try out new technologies in his films. This pursuit would not only give him fame, but eventually led rise to Shin Films, his very own production company. During Shin's numerous film endeavors, fate would have it that he would meet another critical figure that would forever change his life. Actress Che Eun-hee was only relatively new, but had talent like South Korea had never seen before. She had made her start in pre-war North Korea, and had made her way to the South by its end. By the time she had met Shin, her name already carried significant marquee value. However, Che was trapped with an abusive husband that now showed nothing but hostility towards her. Shin made every effort to be there for her whenever he could be, giving her some much needed solace and, eventually, a trustworthy partner for her to enjoy her life with. 
Che would leave her husband and begin life anew with Shin. While they would not hold an official ceremony, they would marry each other by their word. This would start an immensely prolific time in their lives. They made numerous films together, almost always with Che as the lead, which would bring rise to the most successful period in their careers. However, things would soon begin to change as another looming figure would start constructing a malicious plot that would change Che and Shin's lives forever. Shin and Che's prosperity would not only be limited to them, but the entirety of South Korea. The war-torn country would begin to rise into prominence as things like the bustling film industry began to grow. However, things would be much, much different north of the border. The North was home to an intensely passionate moviegoer, a cruel future dictator, and apparently a party-hardy chap. Kim Jong-il was the son of the now infamous dictator Kim Il-sung. Il-sung was given the power to rule over the North through the Soviet Union's influence over it in the Korean War. He was a military general who proved his worthiness to lead, at least in the eyes of the Soviets. Thus, he began a dynasty of rulers that would continue on to this very day with leader Kim Jong-un. Or, depending on who you're asking, the target of all the anime intro memes, Kim Yo-jong. Nonetheless, it was only a matter of time before Ego would overtake the office, and Kim Il-sung would create his very own cult of personality. This very cult would give way to the near-biblical tale of his son's birth, Kim Jong-il. In North Korea, people were forcibly made to believe that the Supreme Leader's son was born in a secret military base at the top of Mount Pekdu, including extra absurdities such as, I don't know, 20 rainbows showing up at the time of his birth? They might as well have told the whole country that he could crap all your problems away and they'd have to believe him. Although maybe not that one actually because you weren't allowed to think that the Supreme Leader got to the toilet, but I, I digress. As it turns out, Kim Jong-il wasn't even his real name. In honesty, Yuri Irsenovich Kim was born within the USSR's borders, a place where any child born must have had a Russian name. This child would later adopt both of his parents' names to gain his more recognizable title of Kim Jong-il. Jong-il was said to be an interesting person in his adolescent years. He would always be partying, looking for a new gal to... <clears throat> swoon, and having an excessive passion for films and everything to do with them. For reference, citizens were only allowed to watch North Korean productions, which were often monotonous propaganda. Zhang Il, on the other hand, had an extensive library of films from around the world. Movies like westerns from the US, a country that was openly reviled in the North. South Korean productions were forcibly ridiculed and loathed. Just so you understand the degree of hatred we're talking about here, North Korean kids were taught songs about shooting the Yankees down south. So clearly, we had quite the level-headed guy at the helm here. Zhang Il not only had access to these films, but loved them for their several nuances and engaging stories. He would ultimately ask his father to help him establish a film industry in North Korea that would be better than any other country in the world. Il Sung would aid his son in this venture. However, it gave little satisfaction to the supreme leader to be. Even though the films were advancing, they still weren't engaging. They felt lazily made, and most importantly to Zhang Il, they had no soul. Now, this issue clearly had nothing to do with the fact that the Kims just allowed stories where the resolve could only be found through the love of the Kims. <laughs> like, imagine marriage story, right? But the ending had the couple getting back together because Il Sung demanded it. Could you imagine? <laughs> then there's the issue of the people making the movies being pretty much forced into making them. Not to mention it was all generally bland and poorly put together propaganda. No, no, no. Zhang Il felt as if there was a specific edge missing that he simply could not achieve within his borders. Instead, he would begin looking to the outside to fulfill his apparent Destiny.
After several years of bountiful success, South Korea's captivation with Shin and Che's work would slowly begin to decline. Shin, now creatively stifled after having directed numerous films, started to lose his favor with audiences. He would take former nuances he himself cultivated in South Korean films like sex and nudity and exploit them as the conventions they had now become. Practically making softcore pornos that Shin knew wouldn't require much effort, but would still have appeal. Although, maybe not as much as he anticipated. This would also be around the time when Che would become a mother, and shift her focus from acting to teaching the next generation of actors. With these changes, their relationship would soon begin to turn too. Once star-crossed lovers, they now treated each other almost as if mere business partners. Although, both would later admit that they did still share strong feelings for each other at the time. Though, as soon would come to light, these feelings alone were not enough to save their marriage. Che would uncover a shocking secret that neither she nor the rest of South Korea was ready for. Che had discovered an affair. Shin being with another actress whom he met similarly to Che. This affair would bear them a child, forcing them out of the deception they had made. Che was absolutely devastated by the discovery, and would later divorce Shin, even though she made every possible attempt to forgive him for his deception. Needless to say, this was a bleak period in both of their lives. Shin would go manic and break several filmmaking rules set in place by the country. This would result in the loss of his studio, filmmaking license, and ultimately, his greatest love in life. Che would fall into a deep depression after the man that had saved her life and brought her peace seemingly turned his back on her. Effectively giving up acting by this point, the only things she had left were her children and her teaching. Time would pass when Che would receive a strange offer to direct a film in China. Feeling as if she had nothing left to lose and everything to prove, she decided to accept the offer. She would be taken to a destination that Che immediately recognized as being a deception. But before she got any time to react, North Korean agents would place a bag over her head and seize her. It wouldn't be long into her stay in North Korea that she would meet the Supreme Leader and his son. Despite being abducted, Che was met with a much more warm welcome than she had anticipated. She was held at one of Kim's personal villas, given several expensive gifts, and was treated with the utmost respect. Still, it wasn't beyond Che that this was simply a means of manipulation and deceit. She would also be forced into learning about the Kims and their overblown false grandeur. Misleading trips around North Korea were ordinary. She'd regularly see statues of the Supreme Leader and plaques literally commemorating things that the Kims had touched. Alongside that, she'd also be periodically required to write extensive letters to the Kims, thanking them for their benevolence, allowing her to live in the country she had been forcefully brought to. Needless to say, her stay was far from desirable. She would be invited to Kim Jong-il's parties and become somewhat familiar with him, even though she wanted nothing to do with her captor. She figured that being on his good side was a far better fate than being on the opposite end. North Korea was home to numerous different camps that were all feared immensely by the public. Most typically, you'd be sent to something of a rehabilitation camp, a prison where you'd be subjected to various torture means and re-educated into worshipping the supreme leader. Once that was all said and done over several years, you'd be put back into the public under a different name with no means of recognizing your former self. This fate was often saved for people who committed petty crimes or other various offenses that would be deemed trivial by other countries. Then there was the offense of speaking poorly of the Kims. If you were caught and had luck on your side, you'd be sent to one of these rehab camps. However, more often than not, you'd be sent to a work camp. These work camps were often viewed as worse than a death sentence. You'd be subjected to severe torture and taxing work daily for what would most likely be the rest of your life. 
Not only this, but chances were that anyone you knew, familiar or not, would be sent to one of these camps as a punishment for being a co-conspirator by proxy. So if you were caught calling the supreme leader a big cheese, chances were that you and everyone you know would be sent to work at a coal mine for the rest of your life. Not to mention subjugated to water torture on the little downtime you had. It was a miserable existence, and Che was all too familiar with these tales. She could always see the look of concern at the party she would attend. A night of fun with a supreme leader could rapidly become lethal. Disobeying the simplest of orders, offending him in any manner, or even look as if you were having a better time than him could mean death right then and there. Nobody was safe, not even the highest ranking authorities at the parties. Everybody knew better than to dare question Zhang Il or his regime. Meanwhile, Shin Sang Ok was desperately looking into any means to make films again. He would go anywhere if it meant that he could pursue his passion once more. This focus would lead him to almost entirely dismiss the news of the disappearance of his former wife. So much so that people began to spread rumors that Shin himself may have been responsible. He still carried on regardless, and his hastiness would cause him too to be abducted. Finding himself in North Korea, he immediately started to devise a plan to escape. His first attempt ended in failure, and him being sent to a re-education camp for several weeks. Even though he received preferential treatment, it was still an absolute hell. Noting things like not being able to lay down unless given permission to, or food regularly being full of pebbles. After this initial attempt, it would not be much longer until a second. This attempt also resulted in failure, and further, however less severe, punishment. Shin would quickly learn that no matter how hard he tried, he'd never be able to beat an entire nation. Everybody was in on everything. Secrets were practically non-existent thanks to this oppressive regime. That being said, this wasn't the end of Shin's escape attempts. He would now attempt to gain the favor of the one man he knew could get him his freedom. Shin would try to form a bond with Kim Jong-il through the means of film. They'd often watch many North Korean productions together, where Kim would openly take criticism to improve future films. Shin, no longer being able to bear the feeling of being alone in this country, would later plead with Zhang Il to let him meet his former wife again. Although this would take some time, they would be reunited at one of Kim's parties. Their initial exchange was awkward. Time had been cruel to both of them, and the wounds from their past were still fresh in each other's memories. Even so, they felt delighted to see each other again. Fate would have it that these two would cross paths again and rekindle the flame of their relationship. It would be in North Korea where they reconnected, even though it was Jong Il's will. Regardless, they knew that, with each other, they would finally be able to escape the hell they had been imprisoned in for so long. After a few years, both Shin and Che had gained considerable favor with Kim Jong-il. So much so that Kim would openly tell them about the failing state of both the country's film industry and the government. He spoke to them in confidence that he gave nobody else. Nobody else could know, of course. As far as the citizens understand, their country is the most ideal of all places on the planet. The Kims were unsurprisingly a significant proponent in the rapid decline of North Korea. One massive proponent of this decline being the economy. Most of its people lived in extreme poverty, barely scraping by with the nominal wages they were making. Alternatively, the Kims cut out a substantial sect of the economy strictly for themselves. To add insult to injury, they labeled this income as a necessary expense for the growth of the party. So sorry if you and your family are hungry, you're going to have to make way for the Supreme Leader and his 17th party this week instead. Nonetheless, these meetings would further increase Jong Il's trust in the two. They would eventually lead way to the creation of the North Korean Shin films. 
To Shin's surprise, Zhang Il allowed him a surprising amount of creative liberty, as long as he tried to stimulate the North Korean film market. Genuinely, if Shin wanted a train in the movie to blow up, Kim would actually give him a train full of TNT for him to blow up. It's insanity. Even though Shin was not in the best of conditions, he found comfort in finally getting back to the passion that had escaped him all those years ago. He would produce numerous films that would be among the first North Korean films that audiences went to see not because they had to, but because they wanted to. The stories were finally becoming something tantalizing. New facets of drama were being introduced to an audience that had never seen them before. It seemed as though Shin had finally brought Kim Jong-il's wish to life, creating success after success and leaving audiences starstruck every single time. Though Shin, being the ever-ambitious filmmaker he was, wanted to elevate himself even further. He wanted to create a spectacle that had never been seen before and leave an indelible mark on Korean cinema. This project would soon be revealed to be the now infamous North Korean Kaiju movie. Well, now that we've finally built up to the point where we understand this film's origin, what exactly is Pulgasari? Well, Pulgasari is based off an old Korean legend about a tiny little monster that would feast on metal and eventually become the size of a house. It's an innocent enough tale that seemingly comments on gluttony and the consequences it can have or something like that. Fun little fact if you're a Pokemon fan, the Aeron Evolution Chain is actually based on the same legend. Pretty cool stuff. But let's talk about the movie itself, shall we? Pulgasari, to be frank, is an unbearably lousy movie. It's all just terrible. From the acting, <laughs> to the costumes, to the set pieces, to me wanting to stomp on the little Pulgasari until it's nothing but a stain under my boot. There's a lot of things wrong here. This movie makes an hour and a half feel like the time spent in a waiting room for your prostate exam. Well, what happens, you might be asking. Well, I'm glad you asked, you conveniently inquisitive viewer. It all starts when a blacksmith is arrested for opposing a tyrant king in Korea. A comparison I am quite frankly shocked flew past the Kim's head. While in captivity, the man, hell-bent on revenge, makes a little figure out of rice and clay, then pretty much prays for it to be brought to life and bring an end to this oppressive regime. The figurine would later get in the hands of the blacksmith's daughter, whose blood brings it to life. Therefore, there also comes along a roar that makes Merzbau Post Demon sound comforting by comparison. Long story short, the monster eats a ton of metal and grows to a colossal size. Looks a little familiar. It ends up supporting the rebels and actually puts an end to the tyrant. Only problem is that Pulgasari is still a thing and is devouring all the steel. So naturally, the rebels plan to have Pulgasari, well, Vor, the daughter, who is inside a bell that he just swallows. And he just turns into stone and crumbles away. Except not because not even a second later, he's there as a the tiny Pulgasari again. So it's all just extraordinarily pointless and mind-numbingly insulting, especially with that ending. Even though it is mocked as being the abysmal production that it is today, it is necessary to note that this was another big hit in North Korea. Although there was practically no chance that it couldn't be, this would be the final production Shin and Che would work on under North Korean rule, until, after a long, grueling decade in North Korea, they ultimately escaped. The couple would go on to hide in the United States, where Shin would continue pursuing filmmaking. Zhang Il, infuriated by what he had felt was betrayal, banned all of Shin's films from ever being seen by the public again. He even went as far as supposedly putting a hit on both Shin and Che when they were in the States. This and various other factors certainly put them in constant worry. Luckily, no harm would ever be brought to them and they would be allowed to live peaceful lives in the US. Many, many years would pass. Kim Jong-il is now lying on his deathbed no longer the image of strength and exuberance he had directed an entire nation to see. 
life had taken the spotlight away from him, and it was now pointed at his successor, Kim Jong-un. Zhang Il would pass away in December of 2011 to widespread misery in the North. Grief and sorrow filled the streets as their savior, their dear comrade leader, was no more. Meanwhile, in the South, a celebration was held. The nation that was once war-torn had now become a bustling, reinvigorated force, and at the center of it was Shin Sang Ok and Che Eun Hee, now living back in their home country in the late stages of their lives. They were no longer the superstars they had been decades ago. There was a belief that the couple willingly went to North Korea and accepted communist ideals. One that they were traitors and no longer belonged in the country they had inhabited for most of their lives. While an unfortunate fate, they did have one saving grace. Each other. Now officially married and living together again, these star-crossed lovers had accepted their intertwined fates. Everything that had happened in the past was just that. The past. And so they lived happily together until Shin's curtain call in 2006. While Shin was met with much disdain upon his return, his passing was met differently. Many vital figures appeared to mourn the loss of the once acclaimed director even being ultimately awarded a medallion by the South Korean president that only artists of the highest echelon accomplished. Che would follow later in 2018 at the age of 91. Her loss too was met with widespread grief and mourning across the nation. All three parties now rest, but carry legacies that will live on for generations to come, whether for better or for worse. All three individuals are now forever tied together to what has become a cult classic around the world. While speculation still lingers over the validity of this story, there's no denying how genuinely fascinating it is. A tyrant, mad with power that will do anything and everything to get what he wants, against a couple from the country he loathes. Shin and Che's story of love, heartbreak, and a metal-eating kaiju is really what this story is all about. Their destinies forever weave together, and blooming into the happy ending they both always strived for. And that is the story of Pulgasari, the North Korean kaiju movie. Hello everybody, and thank you so much for watching this video. Originally, this video was meant to be part of something completely different, but I just got so invested in the story and everything that I decided to just make it its own thing, and I'm a pretty big fan of how it came out, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it too. I want to give a big thank you to Paul Fisher for his novel, A Kim Jong-il Production, for being pretty much where I got all my sources from. His novel is pretty much just first-hand resources, and it's a really great read. I highly recommend it. But with that out of the way, we now have to give the obligatory Patreon promotion. So if you like this video enough and want to see more from me, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where even a dollar a month could help support me a ton, and I'd greatly appreciate it. Plus, you get your name at the end of each big video, like these guys right here. Also, another thing, I've been doing a lot of Twitch streaming recently, and if you guys have been wanting to see more of me, you can find me there a lot more often. It's often just a really good time, and I'd love to see more of you guys there. Both links in the description down below. But with that being said, guys, thank you all again so much for watching the video, and I'll see you all in the next one.